Hello. Hello. Um, can everybody hear okay? So I'd like to um, welcome you all here and um, I just it's forced me to do a little bit of an introduction. I'm supposed to do housekeeping, uh, but I have no briefing on the housekeeping. But I think the basic gen is if there is a fire alarm, people who are watching online, you're fine. Don't worry about <laughs> it. Uh, everybody else um, should leave by the fire exit, which I'm guessing is the, um, the way that you came in. Uh, do that calmly and slowly. Um, I'm supposed to um, be Jackie Bridges, Deputy Head of School Research, um, but she unfortunately can't make it. Um, but I, actually, as far as I'm concerned, that's good because it, it means that I get to do this and I'm really pleased to be able to do it. So I, I, we, we're all here for Jane's inaugural lecture. And an inaugural lecture is a really significant milestone in an academic's career, um, celebrating their promotion to the rank of profession, professor. It provides the professor with the opportunity to share their achievements before an audience, members of the university community, members of the public, and importantly, family and friends. So welcome to you all. Uh, now, many people might reasonably expect that any such celebration attends uh, quite closely to the event that it's actually celebrating. Now, actually, to be honest, that's not necessarily part of the tradition in any case. Um, so, you know, anybody who's sitting there thinking, I thought she'd been a professor for some time. Don't worry, you're, you're not wrong. You're, you're, you're right. In this case, there has been an unusually long delay. Um, I have to say not uniquely long, but uh, Jane, Jane was promoted to professor in 2018. Um, the extended delay has, of course, been in large part, but not entirely due to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which I think also makes this occasion more special because it's the first inaugural lecture in health sciences since the start of the pandemic. And it's a great opportunity for many of us to come together in person after two years in which we've all been working in quite a dispersed and remote fashion, even when we've been coming into the office, we've rarely had the opportunity to really get together and a lot of our contact has been on the screen. But of course, on the other hand, the changes brought about by the pandemic have also meant um, that we've got opportunities and better facilities to share this quite widely. So there are a, a whole audience that are joining us online. Um, and so, so, so I, I, I welcome you online from around the country and, and I suspect around the world. I haven't seen the full list. I, I do understand though, it's quite a large online audience. I think the events of the last two years should also have made the importance of the topic of Jane's lecture um, very clear to anybody who might have had a doubt. Um, I'd just add that part of the tradition of the inaugural lecture is that we don't subject Jane to questions um, uh, at the end. At the end, we'll have a very short vote of thanks. And then those of us who are in the room can join Jane for a well-deserved drink. Uh, I don't actually know where that is. That's probably part of the housekeeping instructions that I don't have. But somehow I feel that we will all find our way. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Professor Jane Ball to deliver her inaugural lecture, Valuing Nurses and Valuing Nursing. Peter for that introduction. Um, can everyone feel all right? Um, I'm not checking at home but I'm hoping that someone is checking that the team's connection and that's going okay too. So <clears throat> today the 12th of May is the day that Florence Nightingale was born in 1820 and for the past oh the click is fine this clicker doesn't like working doesn't matter but for the past 50 years it's the date <laughs> For the past 50 years, it's the date that's been chosen to celebrate nursing. And so it is, in fact, International Nurses Day. And it seems then like a perfect day for me to choose to take stock of my own career, um, which is centred on researching nursing workforce, the work of nurses and the difference that nursing makes. 
And I'm going to share what I've learned about the value of nurses and nursing. And in summary, what I've learned and what the research shows is unlikely to come as a surprise to you. Nursing matters. It's important. It has huge value. And it's a view that's widely held. So in Maury polls, year after year, nurses are rated by the public as the most trusted profession. And if we needed reminding of the value of nursing and of nurses, then of course the pandemic reinforced that. And this is the image that Banksy uh, produced um, here in Southampton. The pandemic showed us what may seem like an obvious truth. So in 2020, 200 years after Florence Nightingale's birth, COVID-19 became a global problem and it shone a spotlight on the clinical critical importance of nursing. And we expressed our gratitude through uh, clapping and, and public displays of appreciation for nurses and other care providers. And those of us not involved in this essential work of delivering care were asked to stay home to protect the NHS because the NHS was at risk of being overwhelmed. We created mega wards, which we termed Nightingale hospitals, to increase capacity and deal with that surge in demand. Yet little use was made of those Nightingale hospitals. Why was that? Well, it wasn't because the demand wasn't there, because it was. But what it was, was that we needed something different to turn that space, that, those beds and those ventilators, from being a warehouse into being a care facility. And that was skilled, experienced, registered nurses. And they were in short supply. So as we entered 2020, the year of the nurse, the NHS in England was running with about 10% of its nursing posts vacant. And it had been for some time. The key factor in determining care capacity was and still is nurse staffing. But we've got a global shortage of nurses, not just in England or the UK. So on the one hand, we trust and appreciate and celebrate the value of nurses. But on the other hand, we find ourselves not having enough of them. So if we understand the critical importance of nursing, why is it that we don't make sure we have enough nurses? It's this apparent paradox that I want to unpick in my lecture today. I'm going to cover three things. Firstly, I'm going to look at the value of nursing. And whilst it may seem very obvious uh, that it actually, uh, we need to look at what research evidence is there to substantiate the view that nursing is critically important. I'm also going to outline how that research evidence has been used, how it's been applied to practice and to policy. And I'm going to give you some background to place the research into context and how it's been used also in context. And as this is my inaugural lecture, I get to give you my own personal take, not just an account of the research and the part that I've played in that, but my lived experience of the value of nursing and what that means to me and how it has motivated me for the past 35 years. <clears throat> so there's a picture of me, my grandmother, uh, on my graduation day. And going back to the beginning. So I graduated from the University of Surrey in 1987, having done what was still a new thing at that time, a degree in nursing, a BSc honours degree four-year course that combined practice and theory and led to both a degree and registration as a nurse. Why nursing? Well, to some extent, it was the classic wanting to make a difference. But at 18, I really had little idea of how best to do that. There was an old textbook of my mum's from her days in medical school called Anatomy and Physiology for Nurses that sat up on the shelf. And I used to like dipping into it. I hadn't studied biology at A-level, with a strong steer from my dad, who valued the hard sciences above all else. I'd ended up doing maths, physics and chemistry at A-level, rather than the subjects that I was more drawn to, biology, English and geography. 
And when flicking through prospectuses, I came across a degree in nursing. Well, I didn't even know such a thing existed, but it seemed like a good way of turning those hard sciences into something a little softer and more person-centered, whilst being able to study a mix of human-related sciences beyond simply anatomy and physiology. And with the added bonus of doing something caring and worthwhile at the end. It seemed to me like it would satisfy both my intellectual curiosity, but also my idealism. As I say, it seemed like a good idea in theory, but in reality, if I'm honest, I'd have to say that I frequently felt out of my depth in clinical practice. I had always done well at school and tried hard, getting the four effort badge at my primary school in Marchwood. Uh, but just, and, and actually I had the right kind of values. I was caring and, and compassionate sort of more naturally. So there was much about nursing that I enjoyed and, and doing the degree was, was good. But I found the art and science of delivering care effectively on a busy ward constantly challenging. The feeling of responsibility of other people's lives in the balance, people at their most vulnerable and most needy, dependent on the judgment, actions and words of someone like me trying to do a good job assessing multiple people's needs and not leave anything undone. Hugely challenging. How do you prioritise one thing over another when they all seem so important? But in the fourth year of my degree, we did a research project and that's when I got my first inkling of what was to be my place in nursing, doing research. In research, asking searching questions and being curious is not seen as being difficult. It's vital. It's what drives every research study. So a few years later, having gained some clinical experience, I got my first job in research, entering data for an applied psychology team at the University of Surrey. I started as a two week temporary contract, but stayed on and became a research assistant. And so my career in research had begun. In 1990, I moved to take up a post where I could combine my interest in nursing with my newfound love of research. I went to work at the Institute for Employment Studies or the Institute for Manpower Studies, or it was called at the time, it's more ironic thinking about studying nursing. And I used my knowledge of nursing to investigate the employment and deployment of nurses. And this was the first publication I was involved with a literature review with James Buchan called Caring Costs. It was in 1991. It was a timely review because big changes were happening in nursing at that time, in England specifically. Um, to put nursing on a par with other professions, Project 2000 has seen nursing education move and being more closely linked to universities and nursing students becoming supernumerary so that they were not counted in the numbers. But to compensate for this loss of nursing students from the workforce, a new role was introduced, the generic healthcare assistants. And these were essentially low paid and unregulated workforce with no requirement for any formal training or qualifications. And at the same time, we had the Griffiths reforms that changed a lot about management in the NHS. And it led to a dissolution of nursing management. So nurses were no longer managed by other nurses. So both nursing roles and nursing authority at this time were shifting and role boundaries were very much in flux. Health service managers and politicians were asking questions like, do we really need a registered nurse to be doing that? And nursing was constantly being asked to prove its worth in a way that I know other health professions haven't been. The phrase that nurses were too posh to wash started to be bandied around. There was scepticism about the value of more highly educated nurses. Hence, the Royal College of Nursing commissioned this review on the costs and benefits of nursing. It concluded that the evidence was patchy and that despite the enormity of the challenge, making the value of nursing explicit should be a research priority. And in many ways, this review has set the direction of the rest of my career in research to examine the work of nurses 
and the difference that nurse staffing makes to the quality of care provided and outcomes of patients. Here that nursing and conditions of care have an effect on the outcomes of patients is nothing new. So this is a diagram uh, produced by Florence Nightingale. She diligently recorded and analysed data on the causes of death in the Crimea, Crimea and found that more, died, more, more soldiers died in care than on the battlefield. It was evidence of how, that how care is provided is critically important to whether patients live or die. Her work, and as we know and honour today, has shaped nursing. But at the time of that Care and Cost review that I, I mentioned, few studies had explicitly examined the contribution of nursing to patient outcomes in a robust manner. That all changed with Linda Aiken's work in the States in the 1990s. And this is an example of some of her work. So uh, in this large scale study in Pennsylvania, she looked at hospitals that had better outcomes and compared outcomes in different hospitals. And what she found was that nurse staffing, education and the work environment of nurses, all each rather, each had a difference, made a difference to whether patients were more likely to die or not whilst in care. Each of these made a difference, but actually the combination of all three had an even bigger effect than any one on its own. This was important evidence, but it was based in the US. So what evidence did we have in other parts of the world? Well, Linda went on to change that. With funding from the National Institute for Health, she took the work to the next level and in 1998 launched the International Hospital Outcomes Study. It was a five country study that aimed to examine the relationship between nursing input and patient outcomes. And I was part of that UK team that was led by Professor Anne-Marie Rafferty and Professor Jenny Hunt leading the research in Scotland. And this shows you something of the results from that study, specifically for England. What we see is this relationship again that Linda had found in the States. That is that as patient, uh, as nurse staffing gets worse, so that's the number of patients per nurse is on, on the bottom x-axis there, the lower staffing is associated with higher risks of negative things. And those negative things aren't just patient outcomes like mortality, but we see actually the chances of other negative things like job dissatisfaction or burnout uh, or emotional exhaustion, which is a part of burnout, increasing as well. So lower staffing is associated with a number of different negative outcomes. But aside from this work, focusing on the relationship between their staffing and outcomes, my research also has focused a lot on the experiences of and work lives of nurses. Started with many different surveys. Um, back at the time when I was at the Institute for Employment Studies, we undertook a survey for the Royal College of Nursing and then many more surveys since in all different specialties and, and many different settings. My time at the Institute for Employment Studies was valuable in many different ways. I learned a lot about survey techniques, about analysis, insight into workforce planning, about labour markets and skill mix. But most importantly of all, it was where I met Jeff Pike, the person who is to be my husband and to be the father to my two wonderful daughters, Amy and Holly. And together, Jeff and I set up employment research a few years later. And we undertook many more surveys of nurses for the Royal College of Nursing, for the uh, Nursing Midwifery Council, for the Department of Health, uh, for WHO, for the International Council of Nurses, for NHS Trust, many, many different surveys. Many thousands of nurses took part in those surveys in many different sectors and specialties. And what these surveys repeatedly over several decades kept finding was that nurses have a strong commitment to their jobs. But there are also many challenges, heavy workloads, difficult conditions, not feeling valued. And that summed up this, this relationship that we saw time and again was about staffing levels and the importance of it. And that's summed up in, in this graph. So this is from a 2009 survey of 
RCM members, several thousand, uh, was the last survey that I did at Employment Research with, with Jeff. Um, and it, it shows very clearly that very simple, it's very, very simple, but very strong, that the more patients each nurse has, the more likely they are to say care is compromised and to say that it's compromised routinely, that those that have lower numbers of patients say, um, uh, say never compared to those with higher numbers of patients are more likely to say on every shift. And this same kind of pattern is seen in different settings. So we did a similar survey in 2013, looking at community nurses and found the same kind of pattern. And we do know that other features such as teamwork, leadership and involvement in decision making all make a difference. But staffing numbers are a fundamental part of care. Good nurse staffing doesn't guarantee that care will be of good quality. But it is nigh on impossible to achieve good care if staffing levels are poor. And by 2007, Kane, uh, many more research had been done, uh, many more studies had been conducted. And Kane brought that research together in this systematic review, covering 96 studies and uh, doing a meta-analysis of 28 of them. And what that review found was, once again, that increased RN staffing was associated with lower hospital-related mortality in a number of different settings. So there was a growing body of evidence that more RN staffing was associated with lower risks of patient death. Again, it seems obvious. So how has this research been applied to practice and policy? Well, in California and parts of Australia, it was recognised that good care depended on having enough RNs present, and they introduced mandated minimums to limit caseloads. But in contrast, in the UK, and specifically in England, how many patients per RN is safe? We have no limits. So, in fact, until the NICE guidelines came in in 2014, there was no formal guidance whatsoever on nurse staffing. The onus was entirely on hospitals to decide how many nurses should be present. And the absence of any legal standard or minimum came as a shock to some of the members of the public that we worked with uh, on one of our studies. They had assumed that in common with other safety critical areas like airlines or childminding or at football matches, that there would be a standard and some kind of legislation to make sure that staffing levels are sufficient for safety, but there are no limits. Technically, an entire ward could be staffed without any nurses. In 2009, I took up an opportunity to work at the Royal College of Nursing as policy advisor, and I went to work with Howard Catton, who's now the CEO of International Council of Nurses, and was tasked with helping the RCN to try and fill this void to produce nurse staffing guidance for the UK. And that meant bringing together the evidence to showcase why nurse staffing mattered, and then describing the different tools and methods available at the time to plan staffing but also producing a policy position to make explicit the need for policy action. And in the same year, I also started working part-time on the RM forecast study at King's College London. So this was a bigger, better study, 15 countries this time, uh, again led by Linda Aiken, but with Walter Sermius in uh, Belgium as well. And the overall aim of this, this big study was to look at the relationship between nursing and patient outcomes in order to inform nurse forecasting methods, hence the name RN forecast. The premise of the study was that we needed to quantify the levels of RN staffing that are needed to avoid harm to patients and the levels needed to create good environments for nurses because insufficient staffing impacts on both patients and nurses. Staff stretch too thin miss things, they make mistakes, they feel more stressed, they become burned out, they have to take more time off sick, and they end up potentially leaving the profession, exacerbating the shortages. So the RN forecast study examined these issues and using data from these four different sources looked at these relationships. The nurse survey specifically included questions not only on nurse staffing but also on burnout and care left undone. And this slide shows 
the range of staffing that we found in England at that time. So these are on uh, medical and surgical wards. So there's a consistency about the type of specialty. And we each bar represents a different hospital. So the 32 hospitals that we covered are represented by one of those bars. And this is the average during a day shift. And what we found, and at the y-axis is the number of patients per nurse. And what you can see there, again, a very simple finding, but quite a striking one, is that that average ranged from just over five patients per registered nurse in some hospitals, all the way through to almost 11 patients per nurse in other hospitals. So an incredibly large range there of what was being provided. This wide variation reflects the degree of local freedom on nurse staffing, the lack of any national policy or standards guiding hospitals about what minimum staffing levels needed to be. So nurse staffing levels are a bit of a lottery at this time. And using the multi-country data set, we examined the relationship between nurse staffing levels and patient mortality. And the results were published in The Lancet in 2014. Based on data from 300 hospitals in nine countries, what was found was that an increase in nurses' workload by one patient increased the likelihood of a patient dying within 30 days by 7%. It confirmed the findings from previous reviews, such as Keynes, that saw this relationship between staffing and mortality. We did some additional analysis on the England data to look at the relationship with healthcare support worker staffing. The same was not true for staffing levels of healthcare support workers. What we found was that higher levels of support workers either had no effect on outcomes or had a negative effect. But as before, it wasn't just staffing levels that makes a difference to the outcomes of patients. The relationship is also seen with nursing education, and that's quantified in this slide. So hospitals that have higher proportions of degree educated nurses had lower levels of mortality. And we went on to look at care left undone. We asked specifically this question, on your most recent shift, which of the following activities were necessary but left undone because you lacked the time to do them? And what we found was that in England, 87% reported that at least one of these things was left undone on their last shift. That very simple finding shocked me, that it was so high that care compromise was so frequent. We looked again at the relationship then of care left undone with staffing. Those working on shifts with lower RN staffing levels were more likely to say that care of some sort was left undone and that actually more care was left undone. So the lower levels being around eight, nine, ten patients per, per nurse in contrasting that to those with only four or five or six patients. And the same pattern was found in different countries. So here you've got both England and Sweden. Sweden because they were part of the RN forecast study, but because also I had an attachment with them there. Again, though, when we look at what the difference is in terms of healthcare assistant levels or healthcare support workers, having more support staff did not compensate or offset the effect of low RN staffing levels. So it didn't mean that, you, that nurses didn't leave care undone. So I presented some of these findings in May 2011, and it was my first lecture having moved back full time to research and taken up a post as deputy director at the National Nursing Research Unit at King's, King's College London. The National Nursing Research Unit was fabulous. Formed in 1977 with DH funding, it led on research to address national policy issues in nursing. It had a stellar cast of leaders including Peter Griffiths, sitting in the front row, and Jill Maven, two rows back. Um, and it was an absolutely brilliant opportunity. And being the deputy director of a National Nursing unit, Research Unit was a huge privilege, but also was a great opportunity to do research that both responded to policy leads and addressed those policy questions but also having a chance to engage routinely with the Chief Nursing Officer team at Department of Health and with policymakers in Westminster. This is my moment of fame. 
Uh, old news now, eh? Uh, the seminar was a big success and uh, Nursing Times, who I'm pleased to say are, are present here today, uh, covered the event and uh, wrote it up uh, and overall it went down very well. But some of the reactions from our nursing readers of Nursing Times were less edifying. <laughs> So the gist of it being for crying out loud, and I think this was one of the other comments, for crying out loud, there have been studies proving this for years. How much longer are we going to carry on wasting taxpayers' money in this way? So what's obvious though to one set of people is not so obvious to everyone. So almost the exact same time, this is something that Harry Caton, a senior official um, at the time, went in print in the health service journal saying he said that lack of staff is often an excuse for poor care there is no direct correlation between number of staff and good or bad care so how do we square those different perspectives that it's obvious versus stop and um, stop wasting taxpayers money versus there's absolutely no correlation it's an excuse if the value of nursing is obvious, why wasn't it informing policy? And why do we see this skepticism? We may have had lots of research evidence, but it took a real world crisis to make the reality of unsafe staffing really hit home. And that happened at Mid Staffordshire. In 2010, 2010 we learned that somewhere between 400 and 1200 patients died at Mid Staffordshire more than should have done. This led to a series of investigations which revealed poor care and terrible neglect of patients in some parts of the hospital. The crisis was investigated by Sir Robert Francis. But the initial reaction from the first report, from the media and ministers, was of distrust of the nursing profession's ability to maintain its standards. Questions were asked such as, do nurses have the right values? And we changed the way we recruit people as a result, didn't we? Are they the right people going into nursing? Are they too posh to wash? Or even worse, are they too clever to care? The Department of Health responded by saying it would be tough on insisting compassionate care in our hospitals. This language of toughness and this doubt of nursing values seems a very far cry from the public view of nurses as the most trusted profession. The assumption was very quickly made that there was something fundamentally adrift with nursing and with nurses. And actually the uh, Care Quality Commission was set up. It was nurses and not the systems that they work in that was looked at. But thankfully, Sir Robert Francis's meticulous and far reaching second inquiry published in 2013 didn't just look at what happened at mid staffs, but it looked at the system failings that had allowed those things to happen. And he says that so much of what goes wrong in our hospitals is likely, and indeed it was in many regards the case in Stafford, due to there being inadequate numbers of staff. He made that link between nurse staffing and patient safety. The inquiry found decisions about nurse staffing were vulnerable to external pressures. But in chasing financial savings, as Ms. Stafford's had, the risks to patient safety and to quality care of reducing our own staffing had not been considered. There does not appear to have been an evidence base for the changes that were made. The attraction of the advantages, the financial savings, discouraged proper attention being paid to the disadvantages. So whilst there might not be anything wrong with people innovating and looking at different ways of staffing, and perhaps thinking about changing roles and changing skill mix. They did that without looking at the evidence and they did that without considering the risks to patients and to care quality. And their decisions led to many patient deaths. Five months after the Francis inquiry, our paper on care left undone was published in the BMJ Quality and Safety. The results made a huge impact because of the timing, I'm sure. It was front page news on the Times, national radio and TV. I even found myself on the Today programme on Radio 4, which was a shock. <laughs> um, and it led to many questions being asked by the media and by the public. 
People wanted to know, well, how often is this happening? How often is care being left undone because there aren't enough nurses? How many hospitals have dangerously low staffing levels? And the lack of publicly available information about nurse staffing levels and the lack of clear guidance started to become very apparent. So in November 2013, the Department of Health published its report in response to the Francis inquiry. Patients first and foremost. The Secretary of State for Health stood up in Parliament and set out a very much never again response. And it included four main policy actions related to nurse staffing, one of which was to um, ask NICE to review the evidence and produce some nurse staffing guidelines. And in early 2014, with colleagues at Southampton, we undertook that review of evidence for NICE to support that development of guidelines. And we built on the Kane review that had gone before. And actually, there was a huge volume of, of studies so that we actually zoomed in and were able to limit it quite tightly, uh, what we looked at. However, even though there was lots of studies, what we did find was that very few of them were rated as strong for both internal and external validity. So there were some weaknesses in the database, in the evidence base. And the biggest problem, you could say, was that most studies were cross-sectional. So that means that there was no ability to determine if the variation in their staffing actually caused the differences in outcome that we saw. Did it precede variation? This is one of the core requirements for observational research to give some confidence that the relationship is causal, that the thing has to happen before. Uh, so the exposure to thing happens before you see the, the effect. So in 2014, later in that year, uh, NICE published its guidance and um, gratifyingly three of the studies that um, uh, I've been involved with, the International Hospital Outcome Study and the RM Forecast Study, uh, they drew on especially because they were the few that actually looked at NHS and England context. And they identified uh, amongst many other different things that they said and, and different uh, guidelines that they gave, they specifically identified a ratio of eight patients per registered nurse as a red flag. They identified other things and red flags to do with staffing. And so for the first time ever, there was a recognition that the number of patients and the number of patients that an RN looks after makes a difference to outcomes and that safety must trump budgets. So there's a recognition that input of, from nurses was valuable and that nursing numbers needed to be sufficient to ensure safety. So at last, seven years ago in 2014, the value of nursing seems to have been recognised. And if this was seven years ago, I'd have happily ended here and you might be glad of that. Uh, and we would, I, I would have had a round of applause, I hope, and I'd feel very good that actually what had happened here was that there had been research, I'd been involved in some of it. Some of that research through different situations had been used and put into action. And then NICE had used some of that evidence to create guidelines and that that had made a difference. That the critical value of nursing had been recognised and supported by guidelines on safe nurse staffing. So job done, it would seem. But the truth, of course, is that the story doesn't end there and things change. So first off in my own world, Just around that time, we heard that the National Nursing Research Unit that had been going strong for 35 years was to no longer have funding. It was the end of an era. We were told that there was no longer a need for a single discipline research unit of this sort. I left King's College London to join Peter and team at Southampton. And then the following year in June 2015, my perhaps naive view that the value of nursing had been really recognised through those NICE guidelines was shaken. NICE was told through a letter signed by NHS England Chief Nursing Officer that its work on reviewing evidence to continue to develop guidance on safe nurse staffing levels for other settings, such as community and mental health, was to be discontinued. NHS England and NHS Improvement would take this work forward in-house. This is unprecedented. I don't think 
ever before has this happened or ever since that NICE has been told to stop reviewing some evidence when it's midway through developing guidelines. One of the rationales given was there was a lack of robust research to draw on. So let me just turn back to that issue of the quality of the evidence base. As our review for NICE had shown, many of the research studies were cross-sectional. So Barbara Mark some years ago had said that a lot of the research in this area has RN staffing on one side, patient outcomes on the other, with a bit of a black box in between the two. And not much explanation or theory about why those things might be connected. So, the idea of a causal link then has to make sense and be underpinned by theory. And what we started to wonder was, was Miss Nursing Care that link between our staffing and outcomes? So we undertook more analysis and further research to tackle this issue. And we looked at whether Miss Nursing Care does indeed sit on a hypothesised causal pathway between RN staffing and avoidable patient death. And this was the model I put forward in my PhD, which I undertook late in my life, between 2013 and 2017, under the supervision of the amazing Carol Tishelman and with the support of Rickard Lindqvist, uh, Peter Griffiths, and with Amory Rafferty as well. And we uh, looked specifically then in the, the last part of my PhD at this relationship about whether missed care explains the, the link. So first off, we had to look at whether missed care predicts patient mortality. And we found it did, that the more missed care there is, the higher the levels of uh, patient death in hospital, the higher the chance that patients will die in hospital. So each 10% increase in missed care is associated with a 16% increase in case mix adjusted mortality. And then we did further analysis and, and Luke Brunel at Belgium was, was central to this, um, to look at whether it mediated that relationship and found that it did. It confirmed then that missed care was indeed a missing link in higher mortality. And the imputation of causality then was supported, but even better than that, was when we did another study that Peter Griffiths led that's gone on to look, use longitudinal data um, and that shows that patient exposure to lower staffing levels is followed by worse outcomes. So again, it reinforces that nurse staffing um, is a causative factor in patient outcomes. So let's turn back to look at how the Francis inquiry um, and, the front, and the NICE guidelines were used in adult acute settings. So I said those guidelines were published and a few years later the Department of Health wanted to know what difference had the Francis inquiry in general made and specifically things like those nice guidelines made. So we were successful in getting funding to, to do this and with colleagues in Bangor we had a look to see what difference, um, to look at the implementa implementation and impact um, that these guidelines and uh, different policies had had. And that report came out in 2019. And on the positive side, what we found was that boards were much more willing to invest in nursing than they had been pre-Francis. It had succeeded in making staffing a live issue and there were better systems for planning staffing. And we did see an increase in both registered nursing numbers and in healthcare assistant numbers between 2012 and 2018. But on the negative side, the number of patients needing care also increased. So we didn't actually see a net increase in staffing levels. Also, data wasn't captured in a way that allowed staffing to be properly assessed. And when we asked directors of nursing what was the problem they found in achieving safe staffing levels, they said the biggest problem was that they lacked nurses. They could not recruit. They reported that there was still running with a 10% gap in terms of posts being unfilled. And so the gap of this demand being increased, the gap was filled then by increasing the number of healthcare support workers. So during this time, we did see an increase in both, but skill mix changed. Increasingly, we're relying on the support of uh, our, our healthcare assistant 
um, and other support workers. So despite the willingness and the awareness, what we found was actually one in four trusts reported that their acute wards were routinely running with that red flag level, with one to eight. So the policies then had succeeded in creating a vision for improved staffing and nationally there'd been an increase in the total number of nurses. But a national shortage of nurses meant that staff levels, the safe levels aimed for, could not be achieved. So the safe staffing policies weren't accompanied by a commitment to invest in training more nurses. Nursing shortages have been an issue for a very long time. This is the Lancet Commission, 1930, 1932, is it? Yes. Um, a very long time, and they've continued to be a problem right up until the current moment. And over the years, as shortages have been investigated, a number of recurring problems are identified. One is the lack of good workforce planning the lack of demand-led workforce planning. So we plan our nursing workforce based on what we think we can afford rather than the amount of services we think we're going to need. Also, we don't know very much about the nursing workforce. In fact, one of the uh, reviews back in the um, 80s, that was what prompted some of these surveys to be done, was because they recognised that they knew very little about nursing participation rates, how many people work part time um, and the makeup of the nursing workforce. So at a national level, just like at mid staffs, nursing workforce has not been properly considered. The effects of insufficiency have not been thought about until too late. So after years of shortage and failing to train enough registered nurses, the government has in 2019 had to intervene with a top down target saying that it will fix the problem by ensuring that we have 50,000 more registered nurses by 2024. And that is uh, work is being done to move towards that, mainly through very large numbers of international nurses being recruited, but also the other policy, major policy strand being trying to improve nurse retention so that less nurses want to leave. But this is a vicious circle. Because why do nurses leave? Because the pressure is so great due in a large part due to shortages. And hence you see this kind of tweet that I just saw the other day um, on Twitter, that for nurses, the pressure lands on them. They do not feel able to stay. It gets too much to bear. Nurses themselves value nursing, what it should be, and they don't want to compromise it. So, and I'm coming to an end. Here we are on International Nurses Day 2022. Where are we with valuing nurses and valuing nursing? What have I actually learned over this career? Well, let me go back to the very beginning of my own career. I felt unable to do clinical nursing because I sensed that it mattered so much. I could see firsthand the time and skill needed to provide excellent nursing care. and the make or break that that can be. To uphold that first principle of doing the patient nursing harm, no harm. Sometimes it's literally the difference between life and death. And as a young woman, I couldn't cope with that, with trying to do this incredibly difficult work in what was even then a difficult context, frequently hierarchical, non-inclusive, constant time pressures. I felt inadequate to the scale of the ask. At that time, as I turned away from clinical practice towards research, I felt that I as a person had failed, that the failing was in me. But my time in practice had made a big and lasting impression on me, an awareness of the value of nursing and a huge respect for clinical nurses, the people that are able and still do this important work day after day, despite the odds but also sympathy and, as the years have passed, a growing anger to repeatedly see and read through those surveys. Responses over several decades that the conditions that nurses need to do excellent nursing care and create satisfying careers 
are so often not there. The resources and the infrastructures seem to be hampering, not helping nursing. Leaving many individuals struggling, feeling bad about the things they've not been able to do, for not being able to withstand the pressure, for having to leave in order to survive or stay and feel compromised. So yes, nursing is valuable and nurses that are able to, to not only do it, but do it well, are phenomenal people and we deserve to, they deserve to be celebrated. But despite the evidence and despite that nice guideline, the value of nursing and of nurses has not been translated fully into policies that can sustain nursing. We still have no limits on the number of patients a nurse cares for. There's still scepticism in some parts about the value of degree educated nurses. Nursing is surely the only profession where it's argued that too much education is a bad thing. And it's not just the odd opinion piece. The disregard pervades what is happening on the ground. Each year, less and less nursing care is delivered by registered nurses. We rely increasingly heavily on support workers for what was once core nursing activities. And repeatedly, there's a lack of investment in professional development and a lack of progression opportunities and career structures. A workforce that is poorly planned, a lack of data on basic things like student attrition. The very title ner itself, nurse, is not protected. Anyone can call themselves as a nurse or an advanced practice nurse. And perhaps the very qualities that make nurses so reliable, so trusted, have meant that as a profession, nursing is taken for granted. The goodwill and the commitment, the ability to find a workaround, the willingness to skip a meal, stay late for the sake of their patients or to help a colleague out. The dependability of nurses makes precariousness of the nursing profession unseen. There's a tacit assumption that we'll get by, that having enough registered nurses isn't critically important. We can plug the gaps in other ways. As though there is nothing quintessentially valuable about the registered nurse. But there is, and that's what the research has shown. And that's what I know. So it's not enough for us to simply celebrate nurses once a year on International Nurses Day. Yes, let's be proud of nursing and the work of nurses. But if we truly value nursing, we have to be willing to invest in it and to reward those that do it, to challenge a status quo that allows shortages to rumble on for years and that sees clever, talented, caring nurses leaving. And we need to demand nurse staffing levels that are safe for patients and allow nurses to do what they came into nursing to do, to deliver care well, to make a difference. We need to use the research findings to make sure that nobody forgets about the value of nursing and the value of nurses. And we can't leave that to somebody else to do. It's on all of us. To support those that do it and hold decision makers to account for ensuring that we do have enough nurses to provide care well in all settings. Too many times nurses are treated as though the problem of compromised care or of upholding standards when running short staffed is theirs. That nurses need to do a better job of proving their worth. That they need to make their value more explicit. It is not. It is not their problem. It is a problem for all of us. If we value nursing, we need to value nurses so that we can all benefit from a strong nursing profession that can attract and retain the brightest and best to deliver excellent care for many years to come. Thank you. So it, it falls to me to say thanks. And before I say anything else, I'd like to say thanks to Steph and everybody else who's involved in organising this. And thank you at the back. I don't know your name, but I know there's been a lot of technical work. But most of all, I'd like to thank Jane for what was actually a sobering, but also really inspiring lecture. And, and I really would also like to add thanks to Jane from myself and from 
several other people in the room, many other people in the room, actually being such a great person to work with. Um, and, and I just want to take a brief opportunity to share a little bit more about the experiences of working with Jane. Um, my story with Jane sort of begins in the run up to the RM forecast study, which you've heard about so in the late 2000s. And um, she was introduced to me as the person that would be able to sort out the large scale survey that we were undertaking in English hospitals. And at, at the time, she was just starting to work as the policy advisor in the RCN um, and previously working for employment research. And, and she certainly did sort out the survey. You know, I mean, without a shadow of doubt, but but really that was the start of a journey together, both sort of metaphorically, but also quite literally, as we, we spent a lot of time traveling together around Europe as part of that study. Um, and, and we both together, I think, developed a wide circle of friends and colleagues around Europe um, who I think we all really came to appreciate Jane's expertise and the insight um, that she brought. And, and, and that work led to the publication of some of the most highly cited uh, papers in the field um, and eventually bringing Jane to Southampton in 2014. Now, um, it, it may um, not have escaped your notice that 2014 was the beginning of the current REF cycle. Uh, and so I, I suspect it is not coincidental that Jane's being at Southampton for that period has um, contributed very significantly to, to today's um, results for health sciences in the REF, uh, where essentially our research is recognised as being world leading, internationally recognised world leading excellent research. And I know it's not just Jane, I mean, I, you know, other people have done stuff, but, but that really is a significant part of it. And the impact of that research has been a significant part of the story that, that has been recognised with and has kept us absolutely at the top of the rankings in our subject area. Uh, the Lancet paper from our own forecast that Jane mentioned, uh, published in 2014, remains to this day one of the most referenced papers on social media. Uh, it is in the top 0.0001% of all scientific publications ever in terms of the ranking on all metrics. And, and I'd just like to, for those of you who know that Jane is very prolific on t Twitter, that's not all Jane tweeting about her own work. So it, 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 she couldn't possibly keep up with that. Very, very little of it is Jane. Um, but, it, but it is worth noting that she is a prolific and well-regarded um, presence on Twitter. Um, turning back to our travels around Europe for a moment, um, it's got to be said that those journeys were accompanied by, by the consumption of quite a lot of beer. A lot of laughter and quite a few embarrassing incidents, but it's okay, Joan, because the funny the, the, the incidents that I remember most sharply actually all involved me embarrassing myself. So I've got no stories at your expense, and I'm not telling the other ones. Um, but other people have shared their appreciation of Jane as a colleague, as a thinker and a really good person to be around. Uh, but it is actually interesting how often alcohol came up in those comments. Uh, so one colleague said. Uh, she shows leadership is open to bottom up ideas and bottoms up. At least I hope that's referring to alcohol. I'm, 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 yeah, otherwise, uh, you know, we're, we're a bit worried. Uh, she's introduced at least one colleague to the previously unknown joys of gin and tonic. Now, I, I don't want to leave you with with the wrong impression, uh, and and it's not really why I'm bringing up these comments about about alcohol. Um, it's not that you know, it's excessive alcohol consumption and obsession with drinking. But but I think it reflects the, the fact and the extent to which the social environment of work is so important to Jane and, and the contribution he's made, she's made to that and, and the large network of colleagues who are also friends. Uh, one friend and colleague noted, and uh, I, I'm, I'm hoping that Carol is there, only work with people you want to share a beer with. Um, and, and I think that's probably a good place to, to, to sort of bring this to an end. Those of us who are in the room and now get the opportunity to adjourn um, for a beer with Jane. Um, I think that other beverages are available and are allowed, but you know, get the concept. Um, so you know, now is time to, 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 to sort of have a final thanks to our friend and colleague, Jane Ball, um, and uh, say thank you. Thank you.